Good day, students. You are welcome to e-learning. I'm your host for today, Mr. Adenyoju Akitle Suleiman. I am going to take you chemistry. This part of chemistry is the practical area of the chemistry. The practical area is an integral part of your chemistry in your examination, and there is no way you can shy away from it. Now, what we are going to look at first, around you, you see that you can perceive some odor, you feel air blowing at you. Now, those air, or the, the, either the odor is offensive or is a good odor, there is a possibility for you to collect that gas. Then how do we now collect the gas? We have different methods of collecting gas. Let us look at four different methods. The first method is through downward. The first method is the, the drying of the gas. The concentrated so H2SO4 tetraoxosulfate 6 acid is used to dry all gases. But it cannot dry hydrogen sulfide gas, ammonia. Why? Because it reacts. Then the anhydrous calcium chloride, that is the fused anhydrous calcium chloride, you can use it to dry gases. It also dries all gases, but it does not dry ammonia. The calcium oxide is another way or method of drying gases. It's used to dry ammonia, it's used to dry gases, but it cannot dry ammonia gas. Only at times it can dry other gases. Then silica gel, it is used to dry all gases, either ammonia gas or any other gases that we need to dry after collection. Now, we look at how the, not only drying that we are not going to, you are going to talk about, but the collection. Let us look at one, the downward delivery or what you call upward displacement. The, what you mean by the upward delivery is the gases that are denser than air. Example are carbon four oxide gas, the sulfur four oxide gas, the chlorine gas, and the h 2 h gas, and HCl. You can use that method to collect that gas in the laboratory. Then the B part of it is the upward delivery or the downward displacement of air. It is used to collect gases that are less dense or lighter than air. For example, is ammonia, hydrogen, and then helium. Those are the gases that we can use the upward delivery or downward displacement of air because they are lighter than air. Once again, we have collection over water. We can collect some gases over water by the time you are preparing in the laboratory. Those are the gases that are not very soluble in water. Example of the nitrogen two oxide, hydrogen gas, nitrogen gas, and carbon two oxide. You can collect those ones over water because all gases cannot be collected the same method and the same way. Then collection in a gas syringe. How do we collect gas in a gas syringe? You use those gas, that is when it is needed. The gas is measured. For example, if you need five mil or 10 or 20 in grams, that is why we can collect it over, over the collection in a gas and syringe. Once again, when you look at what we are now talking about, you can see that it is easier for us either to collect, to collect our gas, or when the gas is in solution or in the mountain form, you can dry the gases using these methods, using concentrated H2SO4, it depends on the gas that you want to dry, or using a hydrous calcium chloride, when you want to that. When you look at this, when you look around, you look at your bag or your shoes, the one you bought for you all over the world, or anywhere in Nigeria too, you can see a small piece of paper there like this. Then in that paper, there are some salts. We call it calcium chloride. That is what is used to it will absorb all the moisture that is in the shoe or in the bag or in the clothes. That is why it is always there, so that it will allow the, it will absorb the moisture and the bag or your shoe will keep dry, and that is why we use that one. Then the calcium oxide too, you also use it, it dries ammonia gas, and then it, gases any other, it dries any other gas also, but the silica gel is used to dry the 
any gas that you have. And then the silica gel is also mostly used again in, in a small container that is kept in a bag. And then you do. Now, that is, part, that is collection of gases. Now, let us look at the volumetric aspect of the, the laboratory in the exercise in the examination. Either any of the external examinations and the one you have in your school. Now, this is how you make your table. On this table here, you have 10 marks on this table here. But on that aspect of the number one question, it is always 22 marks. Here, we are, you, you make, this is how you make your table. If you make the table in a different way, it will not be easier for the examiner to score you. When you have the final bullet, the titrations, that's the final bullet reading, it is all in centimeter cube. Then the, you have the initial bullet reading and then the volume of the acid used. All are calibrated in cm cube. Now, you can have four trials, and you can equally have three trials. You can even have five trials. But for the purpose of time during the examination, you can have four trials. The first trial is you can call it rough. And then you have the first, this first one, the second trial, and then the third trial, where it will be recorded. This is where you start from. Your initial bullet reading, that is when you look at your bullet, that you, what you have been doing every day, that we have been in the lab, several times you do it. But the area we now concentrate on is how do you now get your whole mark on the table? Because that is where students now lose this marks. And out of that 22 marks here, they can end up having two marks. They can end up having three or five marks there. Now from the table, look at where we have, the first one here is 20.50, the volume of the average, that you have 30.50 by you know, that 10 of 10.00, you have this. The first trial, your first trial can be 15.0, that is the total volume of the acid use, and the second one 20.50, and then we have the third one, which is 27.00. What will actually happen here, you can lose five marks on this table as it is. How can it be possible? Now, this is where we have, if you look at the arithmetic, this is 35.40, then you have the 27.00. If you look at the arithmetic there, you see that it is not correct. That is what you call arithmetic error. So you have to take time, look at your table. You do, you do your calculations very well. The arithmetic error attracts a deduction of one or two marks. Because if it happens here, it even happens at another place, your marks will be deducted. Now, and here we have 20.50 and then 20.50 also. There's something that we call a concordant values. The concordant values are the values that are the closest when you look at the, the values now, 20.50 and 20.50 here, they are the concordant values. So if you are calculating your, the volume of your acid use, the volume of your acid use, you use this 20.50 and 20.50, you divide it by two. In this place, you cannot use three values because the values are far wider apart. And that is why the issue of the concordancy now occurs. That's why you are using this one or using this one. But this one attracts. In this one, this one is another four marks or another four marks for you. That is eight marks. But if you have now made and make an arithmetic error here, a mark will be deducted. And then, if your values are not concordant, you will now lose several marks there also. As you now look at it here, looking at this, looking at it from this angle, where we have these two values. If you leave, use the, any of the two values, use the two values here together. That is 15.60 and 20.50. If you use the two, you are not getting a concordant value, and you are look, losing many marks there. So from that table, we are, you are expected to score 10 marks. There's possibility for you to lose the whole 10 marks. And when I make sure you now look at it and say, hey, I've made a mistake. You now cancel the whole table, and you now draw another table. That is to cancel the whole table. You now draw another table like this. If that one should correspond with your, with your Examiner's value here, that shows that you are going to lose a full four marks on the table because you, it's, not your, it's not your making. It's not your title value that you use because you now use this one to calculate the value of the examiner to do your calculation on your table, and that is four marks. You lose the whole mark on that table. There's possibility. But you'll be marked. But when you look at your values here and see that, okay, the value of the examiner is 20.50, 
and then your own is this is 15.60, 27.60. We now go back to the value of the, exa the examiner and I see that it is this, it is either of the two, 20.50. And the other one, the table you make really correspond or the same thing, completely you are losing the whole mark on that table. So here you are having, you are expected to score for, uh, 10 marks here, they're supposed to do that the whole 10 marks is gone. So that is where students now miss. Then look at the titration, the table, the other table here now. The rough, the first, and the second, and the third. So this is where all errors can be on the table where you score. So even if you are making your table, 20, the, your rough or first is the same thing. So you can use the two here. Then calculating your average volume of the acid use, you add the two together and divide by two. Those are the areas that I want you to note. And that is where students do not gain marks. We are continue when we go on a short break. You are welcome back, students. In our last episode, we look at the table. We explain what happened at the table, how do we lose mark, and then how do we obtain our marks. On this one now, we are going to look at the qualitative aspect of the chemistry. The qualitative aspect, we are going to do cut how do we identify metallic radicals. And the metallic radicals we are talking about is copper, iron 2, iron 3, calcium, zinc, aluminum, lead, and ammonia itself. When you do this, when you want to test all this in the laboratory, the first thing you do is that you look at the, the what you are given. You know, you have sodium hydroxide and then you have ammonia. Definitely, you know, you are going to test for metallic radicals. Let us look at it from there. And I want you to note, you know, several of you have been doing it in the laboratory. In this part of the revision, you look at it that the exact area we are you may likely lose marks, and you may even do wrong recording. And in chemistry, as I've been telling you, once your test is wrong, your observation will be definitely wrong, then your inference is zero. On that table there, there's nothing for you. If it is five marks there, no five marks again. That you've carried out a wrong test. When you, but the only thing you have to do, first you have to read the instructions. The instructions matters most. Disruptions matters most. One, why can tell you add this into your solution or into your salt? If you are not saying add it to a salt, you are now giving them that to a solution of is, yeah, is a wrong test. Therefore, the whole everything on that area will be wrong. That is what happens in all examination bodies. Because if you are carrying out a wrong test, you cannot get a correct observation. Whereby your inference is nothing. Let us look at it quickly. But you have to be observant and note color changes here. And what happened in either in drop or in excess solution. Look at copper. For example, when you use copper in a, a few sample solution of copper, and then you use it to sodium hydroxide, you are going to get a pale or light blue gelatinous precipitate. If you're not telling us it is blue, it is not blue. It is pale or light blue. It is different. The blue color, your coloration you are talking about, the light blue and or the pale blue is completely different from the blue you are looking at. If you are now telling the examiner that it is blue, you are not scoring the mark. It is pale or light blue. In, it is insoluble in excess uh, sodium hydroxide. And when you add it in ammonia, if it is ammonia, it is pale or equally light gelatinous precipitate. The only difference here is that when you add SX ammonia into it, it's going to give you a deep blue. Or don't tell us that with the deep blue you are looking at, it is blue-black. Please, it is not blue-black. It is a deep blue. In that area, there is a possibility of losing the whole max here because you are telling you are giving us a wrong day. The inference here you now be copper. That shows the inference. You know, the salt will be given, it will not, at times it may be named, say you are giving a so -so salt or a compound, or at times it may not be named. If it is not named, and you see all these features, your, these observations, definitely it is copper you are now heading to in your inference. Also, look at two ion. There are two differences between this ion two, ion three, but the, react, the way they react, or the, the observation in both sodium hydroxide and ammonia looks alike. How? Look at when you add in the solution, you know, in your test solution, you add sodium hydroxide in drops, 
you give a gelatin a dead, a dark green or a dirty green. Do not tell us light green, blue, black, green. No, it is a dirty green. And then in the sodium and in the ammonia too, it's also a dirty green, which is both of them are insoluble. But on standing, the ion two will be brown. On standing, the ion three. The only difference between the ion two and the ion three is that both of them are insoluble, insoluble here. But this one will turn to a, it's a reddish brown. That's the difference. The reddish brown. It's also a reddish brown here. But here is a dark green. You can see the only difference that is there. Also, a very notable point here. Look at calcium, zinc, aluminum, lead. All of them gives a white precipitate. Yeah, they are white. But except the precipitate is soluble here in SS. It's also soluble here in the aluminum in SS, but the, it is soluble in SS also here. Where you have the differences here is that to now know the three, yeah, the white precipitate is soluble here in SS, but the white precipitate is also soluble here in SS. But when you look at when it's added in drops and SS here, the reactions are very different. That is the area you are going to look at. Then let's just look at ammonia. Ammonia is a gas. You only identify ammonia gas with the with the odor, the odor, it has a pungent, you have to receive that it's a pungent smell. And then shocking, that is why you identify ammonia. Thank you very much, students. I hope you have a nice time with this, our topic. We shall meet again. If you have any other question in our next class, it will be treated. But I just want you to know all that you have been done. Those are just the tips to where you add or deduct your mark. Yes, thank you very much.